Hey guys. I can hear you, Kevin. I can. I cannot hear the class. Yeah. Uh, is the professor even speaking? I. <laughs> can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah. So here, I can hear like you, but I can't hear the class. I don't know. If you can I can't hear the class either. <laughs> Is it better now? Yes, yes, now I can hear you. <laughs> okay. A, a lot of noise uh, in the communication line sounds like communications with the spacecraft. <laughs> it does, it kind of does. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll try to put um, like two in one and uh, do not expect uh, strict logical organization. So the subjects that we are covering here are uh, more novel, less developed in the community. They are not present in any textbooks, and it will be more scattered overview of several useful facts. And uh, then I hope to summarize them in the in the full chart. So um, and as usual, I will give you a heads up where when to wake up and focus, and when uh, you can uh, relax and just. Uh, Considered as, as entertainment. So um, it looks like you have approved, or at least you didn't uh, object the tentative schedule. When uh, we'll have two more academic lectures today and on Tuesday, and then um, on uh, in a week from now uh, there will be an overview of uh, what is expected in the written reports. And in a week and a half, uh, uh, please consider to bring your uh, final drafts of, of uh, written reports based on what you do in your research. Okay? So, whatever is possible to do in this time is good. Whatever is not possible, is not possible. Oh, I need to do the same table about your project. It's about previous, uh, previous one. And uh, we discussed this uh, chart before several times, so you feel comfortable with it. So uh, setting up uh, uh, temperature, then running molecular dynamics, and then see how this molecular dynamics affects the electronic properties of the systems. Um, and putting it in, into uh, Table. So I'll go over things that we did uh, last time, and uh, just it's the best best time to take a nap and relax. Uh, so you seem to be very proficient in uh, flowchart of DFT, right? When density gives you potential, potential gives you a quantum equation for orbitals, and orbitals gives give you. Uh, uh, total data, and then you repeat it again. In some texts, uh, instead of letter rho, one uses the letter n. And by using uh, by either rho or n, you can see whether it is physicist or chemist. So chemists like rho, physicists like n. Here are some uh, notations for 
uh, functionals that uh, neither one of us is need, need. but uh, if you be browsing through some literature you may just uh, see them so that uh, you know where to look uh, if uh, things uh, have some strange abbreviations. And we discussed a couple of times how to uh, formulate what? LD? What is LD? Local density approximation. Yeah, so it's simplest functional, which can be formulated either for have... singlets or spin polarized uh, systems, right? Okay. Who of you needs spin polarized systems in your research? There, there are some. There are some. There is a r recent uh, discovery. Well, uh, Ben may need it. And Gage, uh, I don't know. Maybe he, you, you do, do not realize it, but I, I looked on, on your system. You do need spin polaris calculations. Gu with guarantee. Uh, so a anyone else can skip it. If you're not planning to discuss magnetic uh, uh, materials. So we spent some time on, uh, on this uh, slide. And uh, does it look reasonable or, or completely sent, uh, useless? Looks so good. Yeah. What's uh, our excited state expert meet thinks about this slide? It's very uh, messy. Good. I appreciate your evaluation. But what what is the goal? What is, what does it introduce? Well, it looks like oh. I remember we talked about the subscript of like I and J. How come they're both the same, or how come they're even though we're looking at the same, something's the same, and then they're different for some reason. Hey, and that's how you. Okay. So, what do you think about this slide? Other than it is messy. Blue and red. <laughs> <laughs> I like your positive energy. But what else? What What was the goal? Why should we? Huh? Oh, no. uh, what are we looking? Uh, okay, so the idea was you didn't need the 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 indices to be this. The, they can be the same, but you mm -hmm. didn't need to. You didn't need them to be the same. Okay. Um, let me formulate a question that. Um, you may like better. So, uh, switch on photographic mode of your eyes and brains. <laughs> Photo photograph this slide into your random RAM. And now I'm going to flip a couple of slides back into the DFT flowchart. So, to which of these boxes this, uh, this messy slide relates at most? Third one down. One, two, three. Right? Any... Uh, or four, four, the fourth, fourth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any, anyone wants to agree or disagree with Mary? It would be the fourth. Okay. This is correct, but uh, any other opinions or any arguments for why the box number four relates to this messy slide that we discussed? Because it's a summation with those indices, right? Yes. So and then... What, what does this uh, box four tell us about? The position... The density. Density is the function density. of position, but uh, how do we compose density? Where the density is coming from? Summing orbitals. Are Kamshan yes. orbitals? Some of Kamshan orbitals, right? Which Kamshan orbitals? Let me, in case someone tells anything glorious, we'll focus camera on the class. <laughs> so, which, uh, which Kamshan orbitals are added together? Same as Ernest told about the messy slide that it has uh, red and blue, you can answer philosophically without deepening. Like, there are good and bad constant orbitals that we are adding together. Good oh, so you mean like occupied, yes. unoccupied yes. kind of yes. thing? Yes. Okay, so occupied. occupied. 
So okay. you add uh, together the uh, occupied uh, occupied quantum orbitals, and not just orbitals, orbitals squared, right? And uh, the indices I missed here and it uh, may uh, discourage uh, most of us to, to answer this question, but there should be index that um, I runs from one to comma, right? So we're adding together one of the occupied orbitals and it gives us total density, right? Make sense? Yes. Adding together occupied orbitals gives us total density. You're not going to object against it. Are you? I'm trying to think of what you're defining as density. Yeah. What, what I, what that would I, be the total total density, right? Total density, yes. So that's, a, that's our like DOS. I'm dense today, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> density, density is not like in Archimedes' law. Like, yeah. uh, gold so, is denser than um, water, and we'll see. Yeah. Density of electrons. Number but this would be per unit volume. Wouldn't this okay. wouldn't this be our density density of the density of states? Wouldn't this relate to our our DOS, ah. right? Oh, it's so good you raised this question. We should we should have more free discussions rather than boring lecturing. <clears throat> no, those are different things. Okay, okay. Well, okay. So the Kamchatka orbitals that relates wait, 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 to the. Uh, can, can, I, can I add a comment and then you continue for the discussion? So, okay. the internet. Density be, uh, difference of this uh, uh, density of electrons here and density of states in uh, that uh, all of us are plotting in, in the uh, labs and reports. So, um, as you have seen intellectual effort of Mead a couple of minutes ago. He was trying to set up or seek for a definition. Like philosophically, any intellectual activity of humans uh, can be categorized in three aspects. Giving name to something, finding properties of something, or apply uh, standard rules to uh, appropriate case. And uh, Mead was practicing first option of human intellectual activity. Given definition. So definition of density is uh, amount of something per unit of something, right? And in this sense, yes, density of states that we do and density of electrons here are the same. Only on this uh, global uh, uh, structure. If you go in more details, here it is number of electrons per unit of volume, right? number of electrons per unit of volume. Okay. If there are many electrons per unit of volume, they are dense in the specific area of space. And in, in density, and in this is typically three-dimensional. And in the dose that we all are plotting, it's number of energy levels per unit of, uh, per energy interval. Right? So here the argument is position, and in our dose argument is energy. Good? So, what is bad in this uh, equation? I wouldn't say bad because uh, uh, it is most cited and most used, used theory in the, in the community, but uh, what is uh, insufficiently precise? What is missed in this uh, definition of density as uh, summation of occupied orbitals? If it is not visible, uh, I can focus and uh, are we missing the J term? What do you mean J? I mean, like, I feel like there should be some additional information. Maybe we're missing something? Well, I, I can uh, um, put more, like, more uh, defined, like, I goes from one mm -hmm. to whole. That's it. OK. But uh, not in the way how it is uh, written, but generally in the idea. Adding together um, absolute value squared of uh, orbitals that are occupied. What is missed here if we want to make global theory of everything? And if you relate this question to the 
main subject of uh, chapter 4. Yes. Excited states? Yes. Okay. So, um, we are subsequently going for all orbitals from uh, 1 to Homo, and we are skipping all orbitals starting from Homo, right? But does this uh, structure relate, corresponds, describes anything of excited state? Right? No. So this is a bad uh, equation because it doesn't cover excited states. And uh, very often we do need excited states. Okay. DFT is only valid for ground state, right? Yes. There, um, there will be no time in the remain of, uh, remaining of semester to go with rigor as we did before even to attempt, but there are theorems about TDDFT that it also will give something useful. But right now, we are trying to update DFT or concepts of DFT to the level that will approximately cover excited states. A little disclaimer, there will be no time in the course to cover uh, configuration interaction, couple of clusters, uh, uh, and things, things like that, which could be really useful, especially configuration interactions. But um, we are focusing on TDDFT because it is practically most useful. So what should be changed to this equation in order to cover excited states? Just add the summation of the excited states, right? Like um, well, um, there is also, let me bring in a little disclaimer that I always skip and forget even for myself in, in, in writing. There is, there is a very, one should be very careful with uh, two types of terms, orbitals and states. Hmm. And it is very big temptation to mix these two concepts. But state is state of overall system, like state is described by Slater determinant, and orbital is only one part of this big entity, which can be occupied or unoccupied. But the, if you want to describe excited states, we may include unoccupied orbitals, right? Not only HOMO, but things uh, above HOMO. Mama. HOMO and, and, and above. What else is bad here? Or, bad is not the right word. I, I need to be careful with verbalization. What else can be improved for better precision? A broader coverage of, of, of a phenomena. Maybe the range. Mm -hmm. And it, it is it is a review. We already covered it last time. So here, uh, this is theta of r absolute value squared, which means theta star times theta, and both of the theta do have index i. Another index. Yes to consider pairs of non-coinciding orbitals. So we can expand this equation in two directions. First, continuous summation above Lumo, above Homo, Lumo, and so, so forth, and include uh, non-coinciding pairs of indices. Make sense? So if we make this little step, we are opening the door from ground states to excited states, but we still can uh, live inside the paradigm of density functional theory. Make sense? Unoccupied. Becoming occupied if you occupy them. Yeah. No, no philosophical contradictions. Okay. And I'm returning where we stopped. So here is an update of. Uh, of this equation. So, we are updating an equation for total density. Density of electrons per, uh, in a specific point of space. Number of electrons per space. And we are trying to relate density of electrons in a specific point of space to Kohn-Sham orbitals. 
And again, uh, some people in the community may catch you if you, you use word molecular orbitals. Do not use it related to DFT. Molecular orbitals for Hardy Fogg, Consham orbitals were just uh, for, 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 for DFT. Remember, we were browsing in a, in a crazy space where electrons do not interact to each other. So it is a Consham space and Consham orbitals. So before we were adding together states with coinciding indices, now we, we have this uh, non-coinciding. And our summation can go up to infinity. Good. But if you want to be so general, before we had only pair of orbitals and summation. And now, since we are going wildly into any possible pairs of orbitals, we are not sure which of the pairs contribute more or contribute less to the total density, right? So we need to provide scaling factor, weight, in front of each pair of orbitals. Make sense? And this scaling factor in front of pair of orbitals um, is a set of numbers with two indices, which is typically metrics. And this matrix relates to total density. So it will be not wrong to call it density matrix. Okay? So in case uh, we want to connect this expression to our old-fashioned ground state, DFT, we can set up density matrix um, with only diagonal elements, so that only uh, pairs where indices coincide are considered, and uh, with all elements past homo are zeros, right? So if you introduce new equation, but use this limitation to density matrix, then we are not doing anything new. We are still staying within uh, old-fashioned uh, DFT. Good? What should we do to the density matrix to depart from ground state and go into excited states? Include the LUMO. Um, yes, but not enough. Um, the LUMO, the uh, uh, Meet uh, left for a couple of minutes, I hope. I hope you will return, but uh, philosophical definitions include Luma is, the, Luma is included in the following the unoccupied. sense. Uh, so here, let me bring the, the color. So this one is Homo. And this one. Is Luma. Right. So, so Luma is, Luma is included even if we are um, not doing any, any excitation. You need one word more. Energy. Uh -uh. Another word. And our vocabulary in this course is very limited. Try randomly a couple of words and, and guarantee <laughs> you, 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 you will win. Energy. Energy was already tried. Oh. No? What else? So, in the, uh, if you apply to regular DFT, we take, so here is a list of orbitals, and this number 111 is occupations. How many electrons is on a given electron? And so we go further, you need to change further the down. occupations. You need, yeah. um, you, you are right that we need to include LUMO, but the correct uh, missing word, we need to include occupation on LUMO. Okay. Right now we have zero on Luma and we should have like one or maybe some fractional occupation. And right now we are not very precise. I will uh, condense uh, our discussion in more rigorous form, but generally we need to depart from this pattern of occupation. We need to bring, uh, to consider possibility of bringing occupation 
above blue and we need to consider uh, bringing some non-zero values for off, uh, off diagonal terms. And if we include, if you consider these possibilities, then the, the density function theory will be, how to say, extrapolated to excited states. X try for weight D F T. Again, nothing new. We are still doing a regular. So here is our density matrix in the ground state. There are four segments. Segment from one to home, one to home of four uh, orbitals that are were occupied in the ground state. Segment for orbitals after LUMA that are unoccupied in ground state and segments for uh, transitions between them, transitional densities. So if we expand our definition of density as a summation of products of two orbitals with given weight coefficients, you're not yet tired. No? And we chop summation on the four fragments. When both indices go from one to homo, one to homo, it will be this block. When uh, uh, first index goes from one to homo, second from luma to whatever is available, it will be second block. When they swap, first goes from luma to whatever is available, and uh, second one goes from one to homo, this block. And when both indices scan orbitals above luma, it will be the the fourth block, right? And in some sense, there are, so there is nothing new compared to previous slide, but this uh, um, formulation gives us qualitative difference between this um, fact, scaling factors, between these portions of density matrix. So, the uh, density matrix that corresponds to the block of originally occupied and originally unoccupied relates to population density, right? Occupation numbers, which is uh, intuitively reasonable. Occupation on a, on a given orbital. And those off diagonal elements, which correspond to this, see here we can put here GG for ground to ground, this GE for ground to excited, EG for excited to ground, and EE for excited to excited, meaning that we are scanning different segments of the space of orbitals. Okay? And if you are looking for this GE, ground to excited, and EG excited to ground, it will be transition density, or part of the density matrix that corresponds to transition density. It's not a big intrigue, you may remember it from our previous meeting, and you may have, uh, Ben and Mary may have uh, heard it uh, and practiced before, uh, the concept of transition density. So it is what is being found if you are practicing uh, TDDFT. TDDFT is a uh, theory to find transition densities and transition energies. And when you uh, do select drop-down menu in Gaussian and uh, run for TDFT, it is what, what is being found. These two things. Okay? And uh, the goal for the uh, remaining uh, today's meeting and next Tuesday meeting, which will be like extra condensed chapter four, is to find an equation for these things and for possible transition energies, which could be different from energy of uh, LUMO minus energy of HOMO. They can be changed because of additional mechanisms such as electron and hole attraction, excited electron and uh, remaining hole in the uh, conduction then valence. Make sense? Feel free to stop and launch discussion. Okay. It looks like uh, some of us are just practicing tolerance to the contents. We're like, okay, I don't mind. Uh...
Oh, what, what, what was this? If our, so the change of the occupations may occur due to photo excitations. And if photo excitation has very small intensity, then uh, there will be almost no change to segment of density matrix corresponding to ground. First order corrections to this transition densities and second uh, higher order correction to the occupations in the excited, which can be neglected. But uh, the response to this transition density is uh, something that will be on theories and calculations noticeable in the linear order in the response theory. <clears throat> I hate pre-made slides. I love writing everything from scratch, but for some reason, uh, these evaluations, not from students, but from faculty, told like, how can you write with your ugly uh, handwriting? Prepare nice slides. Well, to my best. Oh, that's rude. <laughs> we shouldn't put it on the record. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what is shown here? Let's make guesses. The, uh, but density or density matrix, or density. both? Yeah. So, the, okay, density matrix. And uh, is there any connection between um, previous slides and what is shown here? Yeah. So what, what do you see? It's the same kind of thing about where they're occupied, like between, or where they're interacting with the, the ground and the excited, and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera, like how we sh showed in the the diagram that you showed before. Like the green part's going to be the one, 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 and then the orange, the yellow, and the blue are going to be like the, the circles, and then the transition right, density. and that kind of transition densities. And then the one at the bottom is going to be the um, the unoccupied, Excellent. or the yeah. Um, uh, let me wait. So green block. Uh, cyan block. And 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 red block, right? So this is common abbreviation of everything included in this transition density. And here are elements of transition density. Right? And this is rho GG is common for this red block that includes this uh, populations. So in case, well, this writing is already ugly and large. But in some sense, it is minimalistic. It would be applicable maybe for um, hydrogen molecule only, when we have only two occupied orbitals. If like home is orbital number two and home minus one is orbital one, like only two occupied orbitals, and everything up is empty, right? So here are explicit labels for I and J. So if we are in a regular DFT, we have only elements with I equal J. Home minus one, home minus one, home and homo. This will be diagonal part of the density matrix, which is non-zero, equals one, and that contributes to total density. And the rest will be zeros. And now, if we are exposing our system to irradiation, there could be changes to occupations due to external perturbations. And uh, the density from, uh, from these diagonal elements may migrate either to occupation of uh, originally unoccupied elements, or as we go through transition from ground to excited state, there could be some non-zero elements popping up in this uh, yellow and uh, uh, blue regions. Make sense? In part. Yes? Is there like any physical interpretation of the 
off diagonal elements in the homo quadrant? Some researchers observe similarity between uh, transition density and, and uh, presence of current in the system. Okay. If change of a quantum system is, uh, if, if uh, quantum state is changing this time, then uh, these elements become non-zero. Which is, which is, uh, and this, those are like discrete elements. But uh, generally, if the quantum state is changing, there is a current. But in the red, so the, the diagonal elements represent occupied orbitals, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and still in that red quadrant, if you go to the off diagonal ones, mm -hmm. um, do those have any significance? Yes. Great. Uh, many thanks for the question. So those uh, transitions by light and, uh, for example, here, transitions by interaction with the lattice vibrations, like photons and phonons. If quantum state of, uh, of um, model is changing this time due to interaction with uh, lattice vibrations, if there is a dissipation of heat, then these elements will become non-zero. If transitions in the quantum system occur due to interaction with light for, like, for in the visible range, if there are transitions from uh, like valence to conduction, then these elements will become non-zero. I have an extended question. Please. How how does this uh, does this in, at all relate to polarons? Or polar, polarons at all relate to this? Would be the better way to ask that. Good question. Uh, in simplified way, no. But okay. If you are not getting tired, or if I'm not getting tired during our discussions. Uh, I do have slides related to polarons or their Oh, animals. cool. Okay, nice. Okay. So, there is a little thing that... Um, you like uh, yes? Like, I was thinking like, uh, when you're talking about the excite excited state, uh -huh. the excited state is uh, kind of a pseudo state, no? So it will be coming to the ground state by a fluorescence, no? So how will represent that state, that uh, phenomena? I like the class of this year because of the deep, non-trivial thinking in the essence of things rather than mathematical details. There is a big Y in quantum theory. So if you were taking basic introductory quantum theory in the past, or if you're uh, planning to take it in the near future, you will, uh, your teacher or your books will lie to you in a certain aspect. So in the basic quantum uh, theory, or there is a, um, I, I, I'm not blaming, I'm telling that there is a chapter, there is a s statement that looks like a lie. And there, there in, um, in the um, postulates of uh, quantum mechanics, there is a statement that if system is prepared to sit in the eigenstate, it will stay there forever. It will not change. Right? So your orbitals are eigenstate of uh, quantum equation. So if you promote electron to this orbital, it should stay there forever. But in yes, in, but in, in uh, Mother Nature teaches us differently. After some time, it will uh, emit a uh, photon and recombine back, right? Why? What is missed? Because uh, no, none of the systems like to stay for a high energy and uh, it's... No, none of the systems 
does it like to sit, uh, sit for a long time in a high energetic system because entropy is very high? <sighs> no, it, 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 it's, um, it's not about entropy. I'm not fighting against entropy. Uh, again, the concept, but uh, there is a different thing missed. Could it just be that, like, it's not a, even if it's in an eigenstate, it's not a, a perfectly isolated system? Exactly. The word is isolation. So, postulates uh. of quantum mechanics uh, work for isolated systems. And our any of the models and molecules that we describe, we can isolate it with so many vacuum in our simulation cell. But in, in the real nature, it either sits on a substrate or floats in the uh, solvent, or even if it is in, in the vacuum, it may interact with rays of, la of uh, cosmic rays or um, normal modes uh, of quantized electromagnetic radiation. So nothing in the world is isolated. Therefore, this postulate is, uh, uh, has limited applicability. So as soon as interaction with some other degrees of freedom come into play, the quantum system will depart from excited state back to ground. So in this sense, we do not need excited states because everything will come to ground. But on, on the other hand, we do observe excited states. Like there is emission. They are quasi-stable or metastable. The um, system lives in excited state for a certain amount of time. Fraction of time. Yes. And for this fractional time, we do need a description of a system. Make sense? Really good discussion. Very, very deep. I like that. So, a little technical detail. Who loves matrices? I do. Okay. Who loves <laughs> vectors? Um, if you are, um, if you need, like, if there is an election and you need to elect your candidate, <laughs> your best object in, in, uh, in the world or in math, and um, you cannot say both have some positive and negative side, you, you need to uh, find your best candidate. Let's make a uh, votes. Um, who will vote for matrix? One, two, three, four, five, six. Who would vote for vector? Okay, we are in the minority. Matrix is the winner. But in some sense, matrix is like square object. It's more complicated, right? And vector is just one thread of numbers. It's easier. And laziness is a motor of any development. So um, by human nature, we try to find the simplest possible object, or the simplest possible explanation. So uh, unfortunately, we are in different boats, but I voted for vectors. <laughs> and and Nate too. So vectors are more comfortable in uh, like if you are uh, trying to program to describe an array of data that is arranged as a vector is easier than matrix and to address and play with it is easier if it is a vector so from this uh, point of view i'm going to introduce a trick that doesn't change anything in the science but it changes a lot in the practical implementations of the TDDFT theory for excited states. So, here is, is your rho GE, transition density, uh, part of the density matrix, right? And uh, we are taking an example, only a small fraction. Uh, so it is up, upper right, transition from HOMO to LUMO, from home minus one to home plus one, home one, home plus one, home minus one, home. No one can punish me for suggestion to rewrite this segment of data in a vector format. I'm not telling anything 
about the values of this density matrix elements. I'm just rewriting it them in the mo most convenient way. So this one, or cancel, 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 just a second. I'll do it in a more uh, logical way. Anyway. So this one is here. This one is zero. This one is here, and the remaining one, this one is here. So I'm basically going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, right? Rewriting square matrix data object in a form of a column, column vector, right? You may feel a little discomfort, discomfortable, but you're not objecting. Because uh, it is only the way how to organize data in your computer. Just structure, how to address it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you write it in the vector instead of matrix, you can address it with one index instead of two. And if later on we need transitions between uh, these uh, elements, if you need equations for them, it's always too good to reduce number of, of indices. But if you multiply with a unit vector in the matrix, you'll get the uh, unit right like this. I could be wrong. Well, you can, by multiplying by unit vector, you can parse elements out of the, of the, of the elements. I'm not offering any operations, just rearranging style of data. So, what are my excuses? Or what are excuses of the people who derive theories and try to, 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 to go this way? You want to be able to use this pseudo vector in a nice way, right? That's the whole idea of doing uh, this? Excellent. It is why I love the class of this year. So it, it's deep understanding of the background ideas uh, without going too far into details. Yes. Absolutely correct. So, remember we discussed that TD DFT theory is a theory for transition to find transition densities. At least I am expecting Ben and Mary to agree with this statement. Uh, with respect to time, as well. well I, I will uh, make additional uh, comment about time. There, there yes. is a detective story about time. Okay. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not ready to keep intrigue until the last moment. <laughs> okay. The theory is called time-dependent density functional theory, but in equations there is no time. And I will explain why. Or I can tell it right now, because time dependence can be removed by making Fourier transform from time domain to frequency domain. If you if you wanted uh, answer to this in truth, but I will intentionally cover cover it. So, TDDFT is a theory to find transition densities, and anything we can efficiently do in uh, modern science, the only thing that we can do, the only operation that is possible, except uh, searching databases and making linear regressions for. Um, Informatics. <laughs> uh, they are, um, okay, it's one thing, and another is to diagonalize matrices. The, the uh, math, different chapters of math, have a lot of advanced chapters, but in practical sense, the like 90% of problems that are possible to solve by humankind are can be reduced to diagonalizing of matrices, and it is very good attempt to reduce any problem we are solving to the organization of matrices because there are standard packages to do it. Okay. 
Tergenovizing matrices is the same. Again, uh, uh, someone quote me on, on uh, bringing deception to the to the audience. Diagonalizing of matrix is the same as finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors, right? So, in some sense, any vector that we do not know is an eigenvector of some matrix. So, if we need to find a vector, it means we need to formulate matrix by diagonalizing, and by diagonalizing such matrix, we will obtain this vector. Like this idea? No, but you are not opposing it strongly. <laughs> so um, the logic is that it is standard practice of humankind. Like if the some vector is unknown, highly likely it will be eigenvector of one of the matrices. And TDDFT can be formulated as an eigen value problem for transition densities formulated as vectors. I'm presenting it in very unorthodox way. I'm trying to do small steps. Typically, one starts with uh, like Hamiltonian and Schrodinger equation and then arrives to the things at the very end. But maybe um, it will bring all of us to the same page quicker if you go this reverse direction. So we are looking for a matrix by diagonalizing which we will get this vector as a solution. And eigenvalue of this matrix will be transition energy that pops up at the energy at which system absorbs uh, light. This slide is for Nathan only. Uh, we can examine him if he knows what is BLAS, what is LAPAC, and what is their difference. I used to know about that. Oh, good, good, good enough. <laughs> um, there, uh, those are standard packages uh, that you can link to when you are programming uh, some uh, mathematical operations in like C or Fortran. There is a library of uh, linear algebra uh, standard operations, and they are optimized to, to run very efficiently. And they include the organization of matrices. And it is uh, possible to parallelize over multiple CPUs and multiple nodes. So, almost done. And I appreciate your patience and intellectual effort. Uh, we need one more step with definitions. So, you either didn't care or you enthusiastically supported the idea of calling transition density uh, as rho GE and rho EG, right? And Nathan would think of them as like evidence of current in the system. Three letters, too many for lazy people. I suggest to rename rho GE as X and rho uh, uh. GE as X and rho EG as Y. Okay? And we should uh, keep in mind that uh, we doing our best to store transition density matrix element in form of a vector. Transition density matrix elements stored as a vector are called uh, X if it is transition from ground to excited and Y if it is transition back from excited to ground. So this is like absorption and this is like emission. We want to bring everything to the simplicity of fingers on a palm. X, absorption, Y, emission. And those are vectors. So if you uh, suddenly find yourself among readers of theoretical literature on TDDFT, which may or may not happen, you will see X and Y vectors as standard notations. So when people are speaking about uh, transition density, they do not bother about explaining uh, notations and they just tell transition density x, transition density y. But now you are certified experts in definitions of uh, components of the TDDFT.
So we need to derive equation to find x and y vectors. OK. If you care about content of these uh, lectures, which you may or may not do, uh, try to memorize and summarize <coughs> what we did before. It was kind of organized uh, part of information. Right now, wait, take notes or memorize. And uh, from now on, I'm going to flood the, our chat with uh, a lot of scattered information. It will be less organized. It will all, all will be used, useful and related to your projects, but it will be much less logically organized. And uh, I appreciate your patience on this. In some sense, they all are related, but we will come to um, overall picture, hopefully by the end of uh, coming Tuesday lecture, if everything will go successful. Uh, standard DFT, orbital square up to Homo. Uh, one can also put weight factor, Fermi weights. And if you do not have off diagonal elements, it will be only like a line, a vector of, of the occupations of each orbital. And uh, those of you who practice Fermi weight to model excited states for photo depolymerization, you are changed by keywords Fermi weight, Fermi weight. You are changing values of this uh, variable. Yep. Yep. If we are not going to anything exotic, in ground state it is 1 if uh, energy is equal uh, below homo, 0 is equal to above one. Total density generally is composed of uh, density matrix of four blocks. Ground to ground, excited to excited, and from ground to excited to excited to ground. And we introduce notations. Absorption from ground to excited x, emission from excited to ground y. Good. So, a little chapter by request and demand of uh, the audience. If you do not like uh, the slide and its explanation, do not blame me, blame Mary. She, re she, re she, re she requested something on Poverance, but I hope everyone will, uh, will like it, at least the, the subject. So, <clears throat> if you were practicing a lot of Gaussian calculations in the past, correlated to optical properties. You may have tried excited state optimization, right? So the idea is, and uh, right now for, the, for, the, for this semester project, th uh, this is most important for me. So his project is basically based on, uh, on this figure. And uh, it will be very expected that he will uh, show something like this during his presentation. So, personal message. Thank you. Good. So, and uh, Gage and Ben were exposed to the discussion at the last, last lectures of the PKM. So, in case, we do have, we consider system in two electronic states, not orbital, states, ground and excited. And we do have all geometry, many degrees of freedom, but we reduce them to just one uh, symbolic degree of freedom. So in ground state, we do have equilibrium. And if we are away from equilibrium, we can optimize it. And through optimization, we will find the minimum. It is what we always do, and what we played uh, on about lecture six or Seven, when we uh, pretended that we all are little computers and we are finding the minimum of, of parabola through algorithm. I have a question. Please. Is the red to the red a Stokes shift or is that something different? I know it looks like we're about to cover it, but 
uh, we didn't. Uh, we didn't. Okay. Blue, so blue, blue minus red is a Stokes shift. Okay. Okay. The blue minus the red. Yes. I'll, I'll probably uh, make make it. Uh, okay. Got it. Fo focus okay. so that we, we see more details. So in ground state we optimize and find to the minimum. So main idea of uh, uh, the polarons and uh, UV spectroscopy of soft molecules, including polymers, including photodegrading polymers, that ground that equilibrium geometry upon promoting the system into excited state will be at different positions. So please try to accept this idea or argue with it. I will repeat it. It is the only new idea. The rest will be technical details how to wrap it up. Again, equilibrium geometry for excited state configuration, electronic configuration, is often different from equilibrium geometry of ground state configuration. Basically, uh, like you have a molecule, you excite it, and it re-optimizes to different shape. And if you help it to recombine back into ground state, it will re-optimize back to original ground state. So it will correspond to this path. Excite, re-optimize, emit, re-optimize again. Make sense? So how can we add quantitative symbols to describe it, not by words, but by specific symbols? So we do have two potential energy surfaces, one for excited state and one for ground state. Ground state, excited state. We do have two equilibrium positions. One for ground state, another for excited state. Ah, wrong color. So this is RES, equilibrium position for excited state. And this is R G S equilibrium for ground state. This is E E S energy as uh, for in, in the excited state configuration. This is E G S. So now let's. Uh, bring a little of quantitative symbols that will allow us to quantitatively assess these processes uh, to, to this picture. So this point will be ground state potential in the ground state geometry. What is in, in, in here? I need to design a game. You want to know? Okay. Right? So, E with, uh, symbol with index GS and mm -hmm. the position RGS. Ground state potential in the ground state geometry. So, this point. Excited state potential energy at the excited state geometry. That's e, the second one. Yeah, EES, RES, excited state potential in the excited state geometry. And there are two more. Excited state at the ground uh, geometry, which will be here after vertical transition, right? So uh, ground state geometry, but now we are promoting up to excited state potential. So we will call it E, excited, R, ground. Good. And the, uh, the one. last one, E, ground state, yes. at the position, at the geometry of excited state. Yep. 
Now we need um, to assess energy differences. So if we promote the system from ground to excited state by absorption, absorbing of quantum, the energy of absorption will be uh, excited state potential in ground state geometry minus ground state potential in ground state geometry. Right? So blue arrow is this Vertical transition for absorption, EVA, vertical transition for absorption. Excited minus ground in ground state geometry. Good. Now, if after some time, and many thanks to Anas, it will, what, what will uh, happen if we have recombination after some time? If it emits, so it will um, excited minus ground in the excited state geometry. Excited minus ground in the excited state joint. And main observation that in the vast majority of practical systems, the length of the red arrow will be shorter than the length of the blue arrow. Make sense? No one wants to object? So, absorption and emission of light occur at different wavelengths or at different transition energy. And uh, the colors here are selected with intention. Larger energy is a blue shift, smaller energy is a red shift. Or you can uh, uh, tell it on the language of uh, wavelengths. Shorter wavelengths is a blue shift, Longer wavelengths is a redshift. So absorption is blue shifted, emission is redshift. And uh, if you want to characterize ability of material, like a property of material to follow this trend, we need to subtract this to this length of these two lines. And would that be our polar on then? It will be Stokes shift. A Stokes shift. In, in terms of uh, spectroscopy. Okay. The the polar one. Now, I've told you about stock shift, but uh, specifically about polar ones. If you charge the system instead of exciting it, yes. the potential energy surface in the charged state will have different equilibrium geometry. It may be not as much higher in energy, it may be a little lower, but the shift of the equilibrium geometry high, is highly likely there. And yeah. in uh, um, substantial part of community, polaron is change of geometry of a model induced by charging of a system. Make so sense? it's almost like an external field applied to your system, kind of? There is no external field. You you removed, you injected or removed uh, electron okay. by some external uh, perturbation, and then its system is in itself. Okay. The polaronic state is also eigenstate of a system if you just modify hmm. total number of electrons. Okay. Good. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. There could be some instance like the emitted spectra will be uh, much more energy state than the given spectra, like coupling uh, two or three. Uh, this is the oversimplified situation. Okay. There's only two electronic states. Okay. In practice, everything is much more complicated. Yes. I'm not telling that it is absolute truth for any situation. And uh, another thing that we do not have time to cover, and which is not included into any computational chemistry yet. There are some developments in the community. That um, we agreed at our lecture about six that we are practicing Born-Oppenheimer approximation, and we are considering our ions as point charges. Right? But our, before coming to this, we, to, we uh, discussed that Nuclei are also quantum particles, and uh, we do have nuclear wave functions, and the positions of ions are expectation values of position 
of nuclear wave, for uh, averaged over nuclear wave function. So if we give up this classical path approximation, then one needs to take into account quantization of nuclear position, and in the simplest way, it will be harmonic oscillators for each of the quantum states, and it will be discrete states. And transition between these discrete states give rise to which part of spectroscopy? IR? IR if you are only in uh, ground. UV. UV if you, um, yes, UV. But anything specific that... Uh, uh, huh? uh, so it is a um, Nobel Prize holder uh, from India. Uh, Raman. Raman spectroscopy. Ah, I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we could see one more spectrum acutely, like Andy Strokes. What is Andy Strokes uh, in Raman spectroscopy? What? We could also see one more shift, uh, Andy, uh, Andy Strokes shift uh, in Raman spectroscopy. Yes. So what is ah, now I see that I'm in presence of uh, highly oh, educated company with deep knowledge in spectroscopy. So. If you are having transition from uh, ground quantized state of the excited uh, ground nuclear state, quantized nuclear state of the excited electronic state to excited here, it will be Stokes transition. But if you will have transition from the excited nuclear of the ground electronic to ground nuclear excited electronic. It will be anti-stocks. Okay? So it will be another arrow from here to there. And then uh, uh, absorption will be redshifted compared to emission. It will be opposite to stocks. Very good. So, here is typical way how um, UV spectra looks for absorption and emission. So absorption, uh, if, if this is nanometers, absorption are redshifted and emission, uh, absorption is uh, blue shifted and emission is uh, redshifted. And uh, often they have some features which originate either from multiple electronic transitions or just from nuclear, quantized nuclear substructure. Uh, what is the relation to your projects? Each written report, each uh, public communication has section of discussion where you tell what you like or dislike about your writing. And you can tell like why classical path, uh, classical, uh, path approximation, I'm not quantizing nuclei and missing some some substruct, substructure in the absorption spectrum. You can tell, like, uh, if you compare, uh, if you find experimental results for the spectra that you are computing, and you see discrepancy, and you need to blame someone. You do not, uh, you don't want to blame yourself. I hope you do not want to blame your instructor, and then you can blame uh, uh, classical path approximation. Tell them we are not including it, therefore we are missing some details. Yeah, here are just an examples of uh, this uh, uh, absorption and emission in uh, different systems. Tired? Or well, not quite? Not yet. We, we, we will. So there, there are some scattered, scattered information. Here it is heads up about uh, what one of the aspects that we will quickly do on coming Wednesday. So, taking into account our tough schedule, it will be really great if most part of your projects will be done as much as possible by Wednesday or during Wednesday lab. Okay. So, it would be really great if all of your molecular dynamics will be done. And hopefully... I have a... Yes? Please go ahead. I have a question. 
I have a question. So I'm a little, um, cause I'm afraid I might get scattered for the methodology. Can we maybe see some, I know you have a, in the booklet, there were some examples in there, but can we have some electronic examples sent like of something like just, just to know we are on the right path. Not necessarily everything's going to apply to our systems, but I want to make sure, I mean, I've got ideas, but, um, or would it be better if we just generate it, send it to you for feedback, and then go back and forth that way? Uh, may I ask a question if the question of uh, Mary was uh, <laughs> uh, clear and supported by everyone? Do you understand what, what, what was the question? Okay, okay I can explain. The majority didn't understood. Okay, so or the methodology... Or, or, or pretend that uh, I didn't understand, like, I... <laughs> okay, okay. So for everyone, I mean, if folks have written papers, they know about this. The methodology is the background of what we're doing. So like you have the background, you have the methodology, you have okay. uh, those details, can, but can the, I, can I, go ahead. Uh, so uh, are you asking about the procedure of research activity or just writing methodology section for the report? Specifically the methodology, like how in depth the we should go. Sec section in the written section. Report in the oh, written do, report do, do, do not worry do not worry okay uh, i have something in mind and i will provide help if you can okay, okay. express uh, yourself and summarize something from the lecture it will be super good but even if okay. you feel it is hard there will be help do, okay do not worry all right cool thanks so um in addition to everything it will be really great if all of you create set of orbitals for your models, right? What are orbitals? Shen's like, what do you mean by create orbitals? Like it's already predefined in our system. Uh, we have a slight miscommunication uh, uh, language problem. Um, you, we may understand different concepts <coughs> under the same words. Okay. So, please, consider to have parcharge files ready in your directors. I would call it create orbitals. Okay. okay. And um, several projects are related to, to charge transfer or analysis of shapes of orbitals as they can uh, contribute to stronger or weaker emission. Right? On one hand. On another hand, uh, we all love orbitals, or most of us. But, uh, like, and it is easy to use this E I N T can, uh, tag in the INCAR interval, energy interval, and create parcharge files for like 100 parcharge files. Do we have space to plot all of them? Do we have space to put all of them in the uh, written report or presentation? No way. Although they are really colorful and, and scientifically useful. So how to address this change of uh, analyzing huge, or I wouldn't say huge, but substantial number of orbitals and keeping space uh, that you deliver to your audience home? Oh, I can so, answer that. Please, please do. <laughs> okay. and actually, the answer is there on, on, on the board, but uh, oh. please, please answer. Well, okay, so my understanding is that the Homo Luma was really important looking at the orbitals, but you can also do like so many up and so many down. You don't need to express all of them because it's around what's happening in the band gap that's interesting. And you can, and if you have things that jump deep into the band gap and to the um, unoccupied, sure, maybe you can go up plus 20, but that may not be something we need to do in this case. So just looking at like maybe like three above, three below, Homo Luma, whatever the case may be, three to six should be, I don't know, that's my opinion. That's how I understand it, but. Yeah, yeah, that's good, but it is um, the way just to limit yourself in analysis of a smaller range. But what if you really see in your oscillator strength file that oh, the most yeah. optically intense transition happens yep. from Homo minus 50 to Homo plus 70. Right, right. And you really want to analyze their shape and make correlation. Or you do see that orbit like uh, Homo and Luma plus, uh, from Homo to Luma plus 10, 
uh, there is a substantial charge transfer from quantum dot to, uh, to the day. Um, of course, you can make your orbitals tiny and fit 20 orbitals into page. But most of people will not read it or will not be able to understand the difference. So, uh, orbitals are defined as three-dimensional objects. But charge transfer often happens only in one direction, along, let's say, Z direction. Right? So, why don't we try, and we will try, if you will have par charge files, we will try it on Wednesday. Why don't we try to consider par charge as density as function of uh, x, y, and z, right? Three dimensional. And then one can reduce it to one dimension by integrating out x and y. So taking this three dimensional function and integrate over x and y. So we neglect anything that happens in x and y direction and focus on dependence on z. In case you are interested in uh, charge transfer along z direction, it will be the most important thing for you. And the part charge files come from the optimization, right? From invest. Anytime VASP completes successfully, it does generate wave card. Well, not if it's doing molecular well, dynamic. Wait, well, okay. as, as soon as it, it is normal termination, not, uh, uh, there will be a wave card. And as soon as you have a healthy wave card, which uh, most of you need anyway f to generate in spectra, there is another in card. So you need to make uh, mix these two components in new directory. Same as in wet chemistry, you need a beaker and components, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, uh, one component is wave car, another component is specific in car for orbitals. You mix them and it ge uh, generates uh, uh, par charge files. So right, we did that last time, so, or yes, in a couple of hours before. Same as uh, cube gen for, for um, okay. Gaussian, right? Okay. And in, um, just in case, if you do not see, um, if you do not see wave car, it should be L wave equals true in your in your uh, in car. Typically, it is there by templates. So in, uh, there will be script shared with everyone to integrate over uh, x and y and make the uh, part charged orbitals as function of z which is a really useful tool for analyzing charge transfer. And there will be, if time allows, another script that integrates over all three dimensions, but uh, multiplies by, so it will be like by position operator, so it will be expectation value of position. Then you reduce all orbital, which is like million numbers, into just three numbers. Expectation value of x, y, and z. Good. It was one piece of scattered information. And uh, here is the name of the script that does it, band integrate. And here are the examples, like three-dimensional orbitals. After integrating along uh, x and y, it will show only dependence on, on z. And for orbitals localized in different part of atomic model, it will be different, different profiles. OK. I don't know about you, but I'm getting tired. Yeah. You should consider to wrap up, even maybe not showing all uh, information. So, nothing new in this slide. I told you, it will be scattered. Oh, okay. So, this is summary of absorption spectra computed without TDDFT. So our goal is TDDFT, but in practice we are doing something simpler. TDDFT will work only for small systems and for um, small range of transition energies. What we are doing right now works for any range. And what we are doing right now is called uh, absorption spectra in the independent orbital approximation. So um, just a reminder of what we do have when we compute oscillator strengths. I don't remember who was presenting oscillator strengths. Me for spin polarized and who did it for, okay. 
David. So you presented like what is uh, the content of the oscillator strength file, and um, last three columns are values three x and y and z components of transition density. So maybe there was a question. Maybe uh, it was just my uh, night dream that everyone asked and everyone answered. What is the equation for transition density? Mm -hmm. Transition dipoles. Transition dipoles, right? And oscillator strengths. So we do have Poncham orbitals, theta. And we have different i and j. And we put a uh, dipole operator between them. And then we integrate it over x, y, and z, right? So expect. Matrix element, uh, matrix element of position operator between uh, pairs of orbitals, quantum orbitals. Okay? So, and you see that since position is a three-dimensional vector, the transition dipole is also three-dimensional di three vector. X, Y, and Z, and each of them has indices. With whom we had this discussion? How to? Okay, you? Yeah. Telling like about, oh, Sudipta was telling like, is it better to represent as matrix or vector? So, in respect to Cartesian, it is a vector. In respect to um, indices of orbitals, it is a matrix. And in some sense, it is like tensor of ranks. Really. So, if we need only one component, then instead of vector r, we put like x. So proje x projection is integration of quantum orbitals uh, together with position along one, one direction. And as soon as you have for given pair of orbitals from i to j, you have three components, transition dipole in x, y, and z. You can write them down as row and column and practice scalar product which will be like uh, length of the vector, right? right? The longer the vector, the better is ability of this uh, pair of states, i and g, to participate in the absorption or emission of light. So x squared, y squared, z squared, length squared, like Pythagorean theorem. So by multiplying this transition dipole matrix element squared by certain constants, we are getting oscillator strengths, which provide us intensity of absorption at a given uh, wavelength. Make sense? Uh, I did send the slides to you. Feel free to borrow equations into your materials whenever needed. It's not a secret. And I'm always forgetting these constants, and once in a while we need to summarize them. So transition dipole squared, and then um, there are constants like mass of electron, charge of electron, Planck constant, transition uh, energy, frequency of, of transition from uh, I to J. Uh, and there is a factor in front of uh, like 4 over 3 pi that uh, originates from making spatial average, assuming that in a realistic world, in an ensemble, your molecule can be oriented at any angle in space. Okay? So, constants and transition dipole square. In case, should I stop here, or not stop, wait here, or if you need details, you can look through slides, right? I do not remember what this is. <laughs> Who of you ever heard? I will throw my question. I will do a joke. And I hope you will not mind. <laughs> 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 Who 
Who is who is uh, in the focus of camera? Oh! <laughs> Love your shirt. So, who, 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 uh, I know it is me, but who is in the very focus? Of Einstein. The Good. Hey. <laughs> okay. Now, what is uh, shown on the slides? Huh? Who ever heard? about Einstein coefficients? One, two, three. Who never heard about Einstein coefficients? My majority. So, of, of course, I have my coefficients, you have your coefficients, <laughs> but we're not getting, getting no price for it, right? So, the target audience for this question seems to be Anas. He knows this material just in, in a slightly different uh, language, uh, scientific language, from uh, more experimental background. From his discussion, it looks like he's very expertise. So, suppose that uh, a molecule is considered only as two states, ground and excited, or even two orbitals. There is nothing else. Two quantum states, ground and excited. And we do have light that is able to promote system from ground to excite. So it is exactly if NSC would live um, 120 years ago and ask the same questions, you would get Nobel Prize ahead of Einstein. You formulated questions perfectly. So what if we excited our system from ground to, to excited state? Would it stay there forever or would it relax sometimes? Would it heat the environment by dissipating energy in, in form of uh, temperature or would it emit a quantum? Could be either or both or, or either. Exactly, exactly. And uh, philosophically, we already discussed it and we all agreed that since, uh, thanks to Nathan, since neither one system in the world is isolated, the quantum state will not live forever. It will go back to the ground sometimes. And it can, again, thanks to Nathan once again, transition density matrix element can be non-zero either in a smaller box or in a bigger box. Transitions down in energy can be through emitting of photon or phonon. I have a question. Please. Um, so relating to solar cell devices in terms of being efficient, there's always like this like, they're not very efficient or they're trying to improve efficiency and it's always below that. Is that directly related to their lifetimes? Are we trying to extend their lifetimes because we know in the end it's going to go back down to the ground state so we're just trying to improve efficiency to get it emission longer emissions? Is that kind of the goal with with solar cell technology? Yes and no. Uh, okay. If you would uh, pose your question about um, light emitting devices, light emitting diets, any single word will be absolutely correct. Extending lifetime and making it brighter. Making it uh, um, forbidding dissipating of heat and enabling relaxation from excited to ground via emission of photon. It is what light emitting diets are doing. Good. But if we are doing uh, solar cells, we can enable dissipating of energy we just need to make sure, well, there are much more than one ground and one excited. There are several states, and we need to have a cascade of states. With lowest of them, we will have substantial charge transfer character that will drive okay. positive and negative charge away from each other. And it is the goal. The bad guy are trap states in the active uh, absorber, and we need uh, to minimize okay. them. Okay. So that's yes. our limitation. That's our limitation in terms of efficient devices. Yes. It yes. is the trap states. Okay. Yes. So back to um, T-shirt of me. Yeah, Einstein. We already discussed this diagram. Excited ground absorption by light, rec um, going back with a medium of quantum, which can be either driven or spontaneous. Uh, the only little thing that Einstein added to our discussion is 
kind of things that we did uh, about polaroids. He added quantitative description. So designed symbols and established relations with them. So established a language how we can discuss these lifetime problems with certain symbols in a more rigorous way. Okay? So, uh, and these symbols that uh, show about rate of either excitation or relaxation, which is inverse of lifetime. Right? Rate and lifetime are correlated. Lifetime is one over rate, or rate is one over lifetime. Good? So, the coefficients here are uh, stimulated and spontaneous. Stimulated is when they are stimulated. Right? Is when transitions between ground and excited occur due to present persistent electromagnetic radiation. If you excite your light absorber with light, it can absorb light. But the same light can induce transition back to the ground. Right? So if you irradiate uh, optically active material with intense light, the occupation will shuttle, forcing back from ground to excited. When it will shuttle up, it is spontaneous absorption. When it will shuttle down, it is spontaneous emission. Okay. Then if we shut off the shuttle, if we uh, switch off the external radiation, and the system is, at the time when the system is in the excited state, then Anos with his philosophical discussion comes into play. Will it stay forever there, or will it go back? If you do not have driving force, if you do not have external electromagnetic uh, radi resonance radiation that will mandate it to go back. Yes, it will. Why? The only person who could be able to answer it on the right language is Nathan. Why spontaneous emission happens? It's not completely isolated, it's still interacting with some things. Yes, interacting with what? Uh, a non-zero field or something. Non-zero field? Which field? In this class we know only one field, the electromagnetic, right? We don't know about weak gravitational know. electromagnetic field. So uh, with uh, um, zero ground state of quantized electromagnetic field. Uh, Gage and Ben and, and, and the rest of us know that uh, energy of harmonic oscillator even in ground state is non-zero is one half of h bar omega and harmonic oscillator is not only oscillating molecules any light existing in the universe even if we do not assign the ray to go one or another direction um, electromagnetic radiation is also can be represented as harmonic oscillators. And each mode, each frequency of existing electromagnetic radiation has its uh, zero oscillations corresponding to ground state of harmonic oscillator. So even if we do not do anything, there is background electromagnetic radiation. So this background electromagnetic radiation will induce spontaneous emission. So any system, even if you hide it in a bunker, against uh, of, uh, any catastrophe. If you put it in a vacuum, in a liquid helium, still there will be interaction with uh, ground state of electromagnetic radiation. And therefore, for us, it will look like spontaneous. Suddenly, it will jump back to the ground. Rate is very small. Time for spontaneous emission is much smaller, or several orders of magnitude of the induced. But it, it still exists. For good emitters, it is nanoseconds. For bad emitters, it could be like microseconds. But it's definitely longer than any human activity, uh, shorter than any human activity. Good? And 
I was too ambitious to make plans for today's meeting, but I'm very tired. But um, stimulating emission. The rate of stimulated absorption and stimulated emission is related to transition dipole absolute value squared and is related to oscillator strengths. In some sense, uh, spontaneous and induced Einstein coefficients, so this A and B are called Einstein coefficients. It's a little credit to him, but it's zero. Are related through um, transition energy and uh, speed of light, and this A is always smaller than B. Right? Because speed of light is so big. But both of them, B and A through these coefficients, are related to oscillator strengths. D, Ij, I left Ij, but transition dipole squared for given transition. And if you are looking on the inverse of the uh, spontaneous emission coefficient, it will be inverse of oscillator strengths. And it will be lifetime. So how long the system will sit in the excited state before it will emit, right? So if you do know oscillator strengths, you can immediately answer question of Anas. How long system will live in the excited state? How soon it will relax back to ground? So in, uh, it is one over oscillator strength that we all are computing and placing in the OS strings file. One needs just to add some fundamental uh, constants, right? And if you uh, go through repository of the code, there is a version of this uh, of the code that immediately gives you uh, values of the lifetimes. Uh, because just multiplied by, by these constants. And this equation was already presented by David, right? I think so. One index goes through occupied, another through unoccupied, oscillator strengths, and delta function of the that parses only transitions, uh, resonance transitions. And delta function is represented as a uh, finite width Gaussian, right? There, uh, note that if your gaps are dense, if you are going into infrared, try to select this uh, width parameter a little smaller. Okay, stock shift, we, we done. Um, I'll start next material because semester is really, really close, but I will not go over maybe five minutes. Stop me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> stop me again. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll, I'll at least start so that we have some uh, background thoughts. So, for TDDFT theory, we need an equation that will give us transition densities and energies of transitions. And we are coming to them by practicing time-dependent perturbation theory. If you took advanced quantum, you are aware of it. If you didn't, uh, I will introduce it either today or probably on Tuesday. So if our Hamiltonian has some additional small time-dependent part, and this uh, time-dependent part is typically oscillation with optical fre frequency, then our observable, such as uh, density, will be equal to ground state density plus oscillating part, which will repeat, which will follow oscillations of this driving force of electric field, right? So since this one is driving, this one is followed, there will be a term in the overall density that will oscillate with this high frequency. But the weighting factor in front of these oscillations 
will be different in, in each point of space and at each frequency of this, uh, de depends on the frequency at which we excite, uh, excite the system. So, yes, generally, this is density. It is time dependent. And time dependence is in this cosine function. But response of system to this cosine uh, perturbation does depend on frequency. And in fact, we need only this part. Ampl amplitude of response as function of incident frequency. And it is an answer to intrigue. Why time dependent density functional zero calculations do not have time dependence? Because this time dependence of cosine omega t is too trivial. We are not so silly to really introduce this cosine omega t everywhere. We can just skip it and write equation for this transition density amplitude. Good. And the um, overall energy of the excited system is different from the energy of the ground state by the uh, quantum of light that was absorbed by h bar omega. So mathematically, goal of TDFT theory is to find this transition density that depends on omega and find those omega at which system is able to absorb energy. Good? Stop me. Stop me. Oh, yeah. Enough. We, we are tired. Let's uh, depart in peace. Have, uh, have happy holidays. Relax if you can. Uh, invest uh, efforts into your projects if you be, if you want. I'll stay and answer questions. I have a question. Um, that's one last question for today. Uh, for the par charge, are we are we going to revisit that in group again, or just just kind of on our own? No, no. It's your own responsibility to have par charge files ready. Okay. I, I will answer privately to emails. I have to do. Some some of you see that. Uh, I try my best to answer, but sometimes have delays. No, that's fine. Okay, perfect, awesome. The, the wave car files. Um, from what I'm understanding, I may have ended my computation a little early. So you're saying the wave car files were not properly created, most likely? Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes. Okay.